Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. As we indicated earlier in the week, the purpose of the W.H. Griffith Thomas Lectureship is to uh, grant us at DTS an exposure to a, a wider uh, swath of evangelical Christianity through lectures by those who have given themselves to specialty uh, areas of study and interest that uh, may not be a part of our own uh, background or experience or even a part of our own curriculum uh, or our programs here at Dallas. Uh, Dr. Oden has brought an interest, he has brought a heartbeat, he has brought a contribution uh, from uh, history of the Church of Jesus Christ in uh, uh, Libya in particular, in North Africa in uh, more general, but to uh, see the contribution of those early five, six, or seven centuries that uh, have uh, made a world impact that maybe, uh, and I know for many of us, even on the platform, uh, we had no idea other than some of the more famous names that have been uh, uh, quoted, but the influence uh, from the south to the north, whether that be Europe or Asia, has been some uh, great insight and we deeply appreciate it. Dr. Oden, thank you not only for uh, coming to us and spending this week with us, you've given yourself to our faculty and our students, uh, you have made yourself available beyond uh, the chapel hour and not just hibernated uh, back to you, uh, the apartment room, but uh, also I want to thank you for the years of preparation uh, that uh, are a part of what makes this kind of a week possible and for your diligence and for your study and your unique contributions to uh, the study of uh, our Christian faith. Uh, would you join me in thanking him not only for today but for this week and uh, his role of being here as our Griffith Thomas lecturer for 2009. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bailey. It's been a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm especially pleased that you have uh, hung in there with me on a very difficult subject, a very esoteric subject for the whole week. You have been patient. And I'm especially glad to have uh, Pete Gilquist in the audience, uh, well, an old friend and uh, Father Justin. Uh, Father Justin, I hope you can keep Pete out of trouble while he's here in the Dallas area. Uh, if you happen to be an Afro-American and you hear the claim that Christianity came to Africa with colonialism, I would love to hear what your responses would be. I want to hear, I would like to see what your level of argumentation might be after uh, the week we've had together. If you happen to be in a um, thoughtful conversation with a Muslim colleague who uh, says or makes the implication that uh, Islam is a traditional African religion and Christianity is not, I would just love to be there, a fly on the wall, listening to the way you respond in terms of uh, historical and reasonable argument. I think that we must have uh, uh, these resources at hand in order to be in dialogue with uh, uh, people that are very important to us uh, in contemporary life. Now, uh, we have been on uh, frame 17, is that where we now are, Danny? Uh, we are now talking about the Cyrenaic Synagogue in Jerusalem. What we try to do here is unpack the layers of circumstantial evidence that point to a conclusion. The Cl conclusion is that uh, Messianic Jews from, from Africa, from a part of Africa called Cyrenaica, from Cyrene, were greatly involved in uh, the key events of uh, Jesus' some of the key events of his ministry, including the institution of the Lord's Supper, uh, appearing in the crucifixion and at Pentecost and also at the transition of the church uh, from Antioch on. We've already set forth that evidence. And I left you with uh, the question, what, last time, what does that mean for the African church today? I will try to be 
further setting forth evidence that will help draw some conclusions about that question. And in order to t lay out that evidence, uh, I want to uh, uh, show the, uh, the uh, hi history of Jews in Cyrene uh, as, they, as they come in uh, to Jerusalem. And in fact, it appears that they had their own independent synagogue in Jerusalem. If it's not uh, strictly Cyrenaic, it certainly was connected closely with other diaspora Jews. It appears that they were very closely connected with other Greek-speaking Jews uh, from Alexandria and those from Cilicia, where Paul was from, and Asia. So it does not seem unreasonable to me to say or think or imagine that Saul of Tarsus himself may have been fairly closely connected, perhaps with familial or with friendship relationships, to um, this uh, group of Cyrenaic Jews uh, in, in uh, Jerusalem. Now, we do know from the text that these uh, Jews were quite angry about some of the things they saw happening among the Christians. And uh, uh, as Paul was, uh, and as, as, we, as we see in the narrative of the stoning of Stephen, uh, they were committed to destroying Christian witness. They were ready to do anything they could. Now, does this imply that Saul of Tarsus and Stephen may have known each other. We don't know that. The text doesn't say that. But uh, it's, it's clear that it was the so-called synagogue of the freemen who included uh, these Cyrenaic Jews that were the ones that gave uh, Stephen uh, so much trouble. They presented false evidence against him. They called him before the uh, 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 administrative judges. Their, their, argu their arguments were very zealous and they were very committed, as much like uh, Saul of Tarsus. Uh, on frame 18, we're talking now about how the Cyrenaic Jews led the Antioch Gentile mission. And this is in Acts 11. Uh, the Messianic Jews of Cyrene had a, a very strong conviction that God was preparing the nations somehow for the coming kingdom. And here comes Jesus with a claim about uh, the interpretation of the coming reign of God. So it, uh, Jesus presented this Cyrenaic Jewish Messianic community with a, a definitive uh, decision to be made. Now, I want to focus especially on the decision to speak to the Greeks. That's in uh, Acts 13. Um, Lucius of Cyrene was one of those who s provided leadership for establishing the church in Antioch. We know that because he is noted in uh, Luke's text to be from Cyrene. Lucius was one of those uh, men of Cyrene, reported in Acts 11, 19, and 20, who first took the gospel beyond Jerusalem to Antioch. And here's the quote, Acts 11, 19. Now those who were scattered, the people, the people of God who believed in Jesus of Nazareth as Messiah were being scattered. They, they were diaspora. They were diaspora Jews. They were diaspora Christians because of the persecution. We don't know exactly what that persecution was, but we do know that they were being uh, uh, battered in some way. It was a persecution that took place, I'm still quoting, over Stephen. The whole controversy was what, what, what does Stephen's death mean? And what does it mean to participate uh, in uh, uh, in, in dying with and for the dying Lord, the dying and risen Lord. And so this controversy had traveled, uh, the text says, as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. 
And they, here's the crucial term, they spoke the word to no one except Jews. Okay, now, here we, we have a strict rule uh, involved. We're not going to try to do anything beyond the Jews. But the next phrase in Acts 20 is, but among them, among some of these folk, there were some men from Cyprus and Cyrene. We probably can guess who that leadership came from, probably Barnabas of Cyprus and Lucius of Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke with the Greeks, spoke with the Hellenists, also proclaiming the Lord Jesus. By proclaiming the Lord Jesus, they were proclaiming Jesus Christ as messianic servant, as the coming one expected uh, from uh, the prophetic tradition and Lord. So this was a decisive moment in the history of Christian mission. There were really two types of responses. Um, and we are now on uh, frame 18, if you're with me here. Um, the two types of responses were, don't speak to the Jews. I'm sorry, don't, uh, don't speak to anybody but Jews, Jews only. And then the second option, speak to the Greeks also. Now what I think this episode provides is some really stunning evidence for the premise that the Cyrenaeans, these are Africans, indigenized Africans over three, two, three, four hundred years of Jewish uh, settlement in Cyrene. Uh, evidence that these Cyrenaeans were among the first to believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Uh, they were clearly among the earliest disciples involved in extending the Christian mission beyond Jerusalem to the Gentiles. I think this verse has profound ramifications for understanding what we've been after all this week is concerning what is the primitive relation, uh, uh, relationship between Libyan Christians, who were Jews, and the rest of the Jews, and between those two competing voices and the Gentiles. This verse shows how Christian mission moved from Jerusalem to Cyprus. Cyprus and Cyrene and on to Antioch, and I believe that the Cyrenaic voice in all of that was through the whole process, even beginning with Pentecost or even before Pentecost. So you have an African element, an African presence in the leadership of Christianity uh, from its very outset. Uh, I think that these locations that I've mentioned, Jerusalem, Cyprus, Cyrene, and Antioch, were all coordinated by people who knew the territory, and these happened to be Jews who had a lot of experience in uh, sea travel uh, around the Mediterranean. So the salient difference here in the early phase was whether you're going to preach the gospel only to the Jews or to those who speak Greek. Now, who were these Hellenists? They could have been Greek-speaking Jews, or they may have been non-Jewish Gentiles, the text does not say, but there's no doubt that they were primarily Greek-speaking. That's clear. Now, why is this of such significance? It shows that Jewish Messianic believers from Cyrene, who were already in a cosmopolitan world of international communication and trade and mercantile activity were among the first to grasp this essential insight that the implementation of the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth involved speaking to the Greeks. Not just to Jews, but to those who are living outside of um, this very self-consciously um, uh, uh, bound uh, uh, community of the, everybody who had a Jewish mother. You had to have a Jewish mother if you were going to be in this circle. 
very clear criteria. Um, so they grasped a special vocation. And uh, I want to point out here the relationship between Acts 10 and Acts 11. That is between Peter's first vision of the mission to the Gentiles. How are we going to conceive of whether we preach to the Gentiles, Acts 10, and Acts 11? How did we actually do it? And what is the role? Here's the crucial thing for this uh, series of arguments on Cyrene. What was the role of Africans in that transition? Put it simply, what Acts 10 promises, that is Peter's vision, at the house of Cornelius, Acts 11 delivers. We see how it is carried out. The African Christian believers arguably made a significant difference, maybe all the difference, in the remaining history of the church, if you see that as a decisive moment. And I want to ask you a simple question. Where have you heard that assertion made in the context of Eurocentric or uh, 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 Euro-American-centric uh, historical studies? I, I have not heard it myself, and that's a part of the reason I'm here talking about it. So here's the crucial sequence. We learn from meeting of uh, Peter's meeting with Cornelius, with the previous chapter, that the Gentiles, that is the non-Jews, were to be recipients of the gospel. That text says uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the descent of the animals with uh, uh, non-kosher non uh, hoofs, uh, that is descending, and the voice of the Spirit says, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, wait, wait a minute now, I, I, don't, I don't do that, I've been trained better than that. And then the, Peter, the, then the, 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 the Spirit speaks again. Getting through on that point was not easy for the early church. Um, but then Acts 11 shows how the vision of Peter was carried out, and I believe it's not unfair to say it was in part carried out, in significant part, by Jews of Cyrene, believing Messianic Jews of Cyrene. And that means from Africa? Well, I call it Africa. Every cartographer I know of calls it Africa. We're talking about Africans. Uh, and more specifically, <laughs> this is the funny part, wait a minute, from Libya? Whoever heard of that, that, that Libyans were right there in the middle of uh, the first transition into the Gentile world. I think that's what the text is saying to us. So the Gentiles were promised to receive the, Holy, uh, to receive, uh, the, the, the gospel, by the power of the Spirit, and the record shows that the concrete steps made for them doing so was mediated by, at least in part mediated by, these men of Cyrene. And I also am firmly convinced that we're talking about women of Cyrene. We actually have two, of, two references. One, I think there were women, of course, in this whole uh, process of uh, transmission uh, and testimony. One of them is the mother of Mark, uh, who was a relative, as we know from the text, a relative of Barnabas, and the place, uh, he offered the place, the home, where the, first, the institution, institution of the Lord's Supper was offered in, uh, uh, in, in, in Mount Zion in, um, in Jerusalem. I'm not going to be dealing with that passage, but uh, it's, it's very firmly in the text. And second, the, the second uh, mother is, of course, the mother of Rufus, who appears in uh, Paul's greeting to uh, Rome. Uh, by that time, Mark had, Mark and probably his mother had shown up in the church in Rome. Um, so it is this group of early Cyrenaic Christians, or those associated uh, with them, who were found in Antioch praying and fasting, and it is there that the Holy Spirit again meets them and says something. 
set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Set apart means I got something special for these. These are Greek-speaking Jews, one from Tarsus, one from Cyprus. I've got something special for them to do. This is the work for which I, to which I have called them. They're elected by the Spirit. Now, I also want to mention another character somewhat in the background, but in my view, a very special character for early African Christianity, and that is Lucius of Cyrene. We know he's from Cyrene because the text indicates that. Uh, he was regarded as a chosen vessel. Lucius of Cyrene was among uh, this group in Antioch who had fled from Jerusalem to Antioch. We're, we're at uh, Acts 13 now. Lucius was one of those described as either a prophet or a teacher, along with, of course, Barnabas and Simon the Black, Niger. These were, by the Spirit, chosen vessels who were called to lay hands upon Barnabas and Saul for the first missionary journey beyond Antioch. And Mark would be, don't know his role exactly, but he would be right there in the midst of them. At least he was at first. We don't know the reasons why he didn't remain with them exactly, but we know it was a little bit of a, 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 a dispute. But think of it for a moment. Ponder with me, and if you could, ponder with African eyes. Think of it as if you were a believer living on the African continent today. Think about that little group in Antioch. Here you got Mark of Cyrene, according to African tradition. You got Lucius of Cyrene, and you got somebody else there called Simon the Black. All, there, all of them are there with Saul of Tarsus, and they're praying and they're fasting, and they are ordaining, they are laying their hands on chosen vessels. That means Barnabas and Saul, and Mark goes along with them for the first missionary journey. Acts 13, 3. Now, we don't know much more about Lucius, but we know that he may have been one of those of the congregation to whom Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. The text really doesn't reveal that he is there, but in the Orthodox Synexarium, we, uh, uh, we have the report that Lucius of Cyrene was the first bishop of Cyrene. Uh, another tradition reports that someone named Lucius was the leader of the church at Sincreae, where Paul and uh, Phoebe ministered. Uh, Phoebe was likely a servant there or deacon, deaconess there who delivered uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. And then there is we don't know whether that Lucius is the same as Lucius who is elsewhere noted as a kinsman of Paul. All this is very intriguing. But what we do know is that Lucius was a leader of that believing Christian community in Antioch as reported there in Acts 13. Now we're on frame 19. Next question, I'm going to do it very briefly, but did any of them return back to Cyrene? We don't really have the answer here in terms of farm documentation. But let's just raise this question. Wouldn't it be also expected that some of these highly committed Messianic Jews from Cyrenaica would, at some point, and probably not long after Pentecost, bring the gospel back somehow, one way or another, to their home country in North Africa? Um, there were many Messianic Jews in, the, uh, in Cyrenaica at that time. We, we know that there were a lot of them because a lot of them were killed in the, in the revolt of uh, 1, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, that revolt actually started in Cyrene and then moved to Cyprus and then later showed up in Alexandria where literally hundreds, apparently hundreds of thousands were killed. 
Uh, now, I want to ask the question, how many Cyrenaic Jews do, are, have we noted already in the New Testament narrative? Uh, I think there must be at least a dozen, but I think maximally there could be many dozens and perhaps quite a number of Cyrenaic Christian families involved in this early, earliest layer, these earliest layers of Christian witness, uh, both in Jerusalem and uh, in Antioch and, and beyond. Uh, by inference, these could also have included John Mark and the mother of Mark and her brother Barnabas and perhaps Stephen. But it certainly included Lucius. Now all of this is, everything I've just said is based upon firm historical documentation. But if you go to the Coptic tradition, which is according to European eyes, um, mostly based on hag hagiographical uh, 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 later oral tradition. But it's clear in the Coptic tradition, uh, Mark was born in Cyrene. And it was from Cyrene that Mark came to Alexandria. I mean, this is clearly in uh, the, the Coptic histories of, of uh, the Alexandrian Patriarchate. Uh, Coptic historians hold that somewhere in the, in the 40s AD, Mark returned from uh, his mission back to Cyrene, where he converted many Jews and Greeks, and then later went to Alexandria, preached, came back to Cyrene, appointed Lucius as the bishop of, of uh, Cyrene, and then returned to Alexandria, where he was martyred. Now, that's the Coptic memory. I've been calling it the African memory. Now, but is there any archaeological corroborating evidence here? I want to uh, show this evidence very, very briefly, if I can. Uh, I'll go over this quickly. Uh, archaeological evidence confirms some aspects of the literary reports of Cyrenaic Jews in Jerusalem. Here I'm talking about Eliezer Zakunik, who is a very famous he, uh, uh, Jewish archaeologist of Hebrew University, who in 1941 discovered a rock tomb in the Kidron Valley in the southeastern part of Jerusalem. Uh, Zakunik would later uh, be the one who discovered and, and made um, and preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls for the state of Israel. So he's not an ancillary figure in Jewish archaeology. In, in Jewish archaeology. But it's, the pottery of the Kidron uh, tomb is clear. It dates to the first century. So that's, um, that's generally agreed. And in these ruins, there was found a first century os ossuary. That means a funeral casket or a bone box. This was found along with 11 other ossuaries. And after... Uh, 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 they studied this very carefully, and this epigraphic evidence then became uh, uh, more startling. This tomb uh, uh, almost certainly belonged to a Cyrenaic family living in Jerusalem. Uh, they could have been killed or exiled uh, at about the time of the uh, Roman destruction of Jerusalem around 70 AD. But Here's the epigraphic evidence. There are about 15 inscriptions on these ossuaries. And they had the names of people, names that are common in Cyrenaica. Uh, so on one of these ossuaries, one inscription says, <laughs> surprise, Alexandros, son of Simon. Alexandros, son of Simon. Now that's on the front side, and then you turn on the back side, and there's something even more intriguing. Uh, there's the word uh, uh, "curdenant," which most observers think is a reference to the Hebrew word for Cyrenian, Kirene. Now there's no way to conclusively demonstrate that this particular Simon is the same person that's mentioned in the Bible as the carrier of the cross. But statistically, it does seem really quite uh, not only possible, but in my view, from what I've read, uh, probable. 
I'm reading here from ancient Jewish epitaphs, uh, quote, when we consider how uncommon the name Alexander was and the note that the ossuary inscription lists him in the same relationship to Simon as the New Testament does, and recall that the burial cave contains the remains of people from Cyrenaica. The chance that the Simon on the ossuary refers to the Simon of Cyrene mentioned in the Gospel seems very likely. I'm quoting from uh, P.W. Vanderhorst, who writes, if indeed they were Cyrene, there is at least a good chance that we have here the ossuary of Alexander, the son of the man who carried the cross. Now, I don't want to presume that I have historical evidence here. That would be pushing it too far. But what I'm trying to lay out here is circumstantial evidence for, for your rational understanding to put together. Now, the next frame is Simon of Cyrene, and this is among the most interesting parts of this whole narrative, in my view. The, uh, the, the relationship of Simon of Cyrene and Simeon called Niger. I want to very quickly set forth um, the reasons why it certainly has been debated as to whether the Simon of Cyrene and Simon of Niger were two people or one. I want, to, I want to state the reasons why it can be reasonably argued that these two people were one person. I'm going to set these forth very quickly. I have nine points. And the the basis of an affirmative answer that we're talking about one person depends upon putting together this combination of probabilities. So we don't have the hard documentary evidence that we would like to have or that we might wish to have, but uh, in any event, we've got what we've got. Number one, the names of Simon and Simeon are varied spellings of the same name. Number two, it is Mark alone of the four Gospels who provides the unique and personal information about Simon of Cyrene. Namely, Mark knows the boys' names. Does that mean that he knew them personally? Maybe he doesn't even know the father, but he did know the sons. And he, he assumed that his audience knew the sons as well. Um, uh, and uh, one could argue that the other synoptic writers learned this from Mark that Simon was from Cyrene. Now third, if other arguments from Coptic historians should prove correct that Mark was a son of Cyrene and Simon came from Cyrene, that would make it more plausible that Mark alone of the four synoptic writers would have known him personally. Fourth, Sim Simeon called Niger had clearly a Jewish name and Niger is simply Latin for black. This would fit in with an ethnic pro profile of a Jew known within the circle of the disciples to be from Africa, regardless of what the skin pigment is. But of course, Jews uh, from Africa could have, could, have, could have had darker or lighter skin pigments. Um, uh, we do know that he was traveling to Jerusalem at feast time. Um, And then the next, uh, the next point, I'm sorry to, get, to stumble here, but it, it, it has been, uh, there's another point that's been overlooked, and that, there is, that is that there is a mountain in Libya named Niger, Black Mountain, you would say, in the Garama region. Uh, perhaps that is where Simon of Niger came from. Uh, remember that, uh, six, remember that the Jews had resided in Cyrene for 300 years. Uh, the skin pigment of Jews ranges from dark to light uh, in that area. Seven, we know that Simon of Cyrene was a visitor to Jerusalem and was remembered uh, in a personal fashion by both Mark and Paul. We'll set forth the evidence for Paul later. We know that Simon called black was first mentioned as being among the men of Cyrene. So, Simon Niger is, is, is associated with the same group of people who first uh, executed the mission of, of, uh, to Greek-speaking uh, um, godly people in, in Antioch and Cyprus. 
Saul of Tarsus himself had cultural affinities with these prophets and teachers. They, they all spoke Greek. They were all uh, very um, committed uh, uh, Jews. Uh, so there was some link that bound together Saul with the Cyrenaeans. Point eight is that Simon the Black was a leader in the church founded by Cyrenaeans because he shows up uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the group in Antioch. Finally, the most this is ninth point, the most astonishing component of all of these bits of information is that Paul apparently knew, very personally knew Rufus, who was at that time already living in Rome, and he knew the mother of Rufus. Let's talk about this for a moment. We're in Romans 16, 13. So intimate was this relationship that the great Paul said that she, the mother of Rufus, was like a mother to me too. Now, how would that have occurred? Uh, there's no reason to rule out the possibility that this Rufus could be the son of Simon of Cyrene, and hence himself an African by birth. If so, the mother of Rufus would have been the wife of Simon of Cyrene who bore Jesus' cross, as reported by Mark, who probably knew the boys. Now, there, there, uh, I want to quote for a, a fairly long quote from, uh, this is, I'll be quick about this, David Kosabuki, who, who draws all of this circumstantial evidence together in a single pattern. Listen carefully and I'll be done. So now we can begin to connect the dots. What this whole exercise is about is connecting the dots into a possible history. Simon of Cyrene became a believer in Jesus Christ, and his sons were well known in the early church. He later traveled to Antioch and helped to get the church started there. That's the Simon the Black that we're, we're meeting in Antioch. His wife and sons were with him. In Antioch, he received the nickname Niger, that is, the black guy, for being a dark-skinned Jew. He was later joined in Antioch by Paul, then he was Saul of Tarsus, and later yet John Mark, who both got to know and love him and his wife and his sons. That is, Paul got to know Alexander and Rufus. They were indeed prominent in the church there, and, uh, in part because of the unique role that Simon played in the crucifixion story. Writing to a Roman audience, Mark mentions Rufus and Alexander because he, this is Mark's, uh, 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 Mark is writing his gospel to a Roman, uh, to a Roman audience, according to most uh, critics, uh, because he and the Roman church knew them personally. Mark knew the boys personally. Paul then, writing also to the Romans, get this, <laughs> greets Rufus as if he knew him, and knew him well. Um, and uh, astonishingly regards, gives, sends his regards to Rufus's mother and gives her this amazing acknowledgement. You, you're just like my own mom, you know? That's just, that's amazing. Now, uh, Harold Honer put in my hands uh, yesterday a lovely quote which I will end with. Um, this is a comment by uh, Barclay on Mark 15, 21. He says, Now, if a man is identified by the names of his sons, it means that although he himself may not be personally known to the community to whom the story is being told, his sons are. This assumes that Alexander and Rufus maybe had, had a much wider reputation both in Rome and Jerusalem and Antioch than their father who carried the cross. To what church then did Mark write his gospel? Well, we're pretty sure about this. He wrote it to the church of Rome. There's quite a bit of evidence on this. And he knew that it, that, that church would know that Alexander and Ru who Alexander and Rufus were. 
everybody in Rome who was Christian would have known about these boys. Almost certainly here we find again Rufus, the son of that Simon who carried the cross of Jesus. <laughs>